And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, making their, making their, for, making their foray into the wild and wacky world of crowdfunding. I don't have as many alliterations with W, so that's as best as you're going to get with the Elven Renaissance. The one, the one and only Kathleen Rowan. How are you doing tonight? I am doing excellent. Thank you so much. Well, thank, thank you for thank you for coming on and braving the hell of time zones to make, <laughs> to make it up here because time zones are my personal hell. Uh, yeah, I, one of our uh, teammates actually is based out of South Africa, so we're we're super sympathetic to that. <laughs> oh, yeah, and I'm get, I'm gonna have to do. I've got a, I've got a bunch I've got a bunch of I've got a bunch of colleagues in um, Italy of all places. Which, whenever I need to get one of them on, it's always a experience. <laughs> so what what time? Is it? I don't know. It's some kind of time. Um. <laughs> I think there's I think there's like a seven or eight hour difference from me from me and probably a, a um six or, and probably um six hour difference for you because I think you're on Eastern time. Correct. Yeah. Which Eastern to Central isn't that much of a jump compared to some of the other ones I've done. Then then you get into the weird ass situations like like um what time zone you're in in Michigan depends on where you are. <laughs> or parts of australia deciding to split into 30 minute time zones for some reason oh see that's just cheating right like no like it, i mean it's bad enough that like i mean i appreciate they don't but what is it Aaron, arizona and hawaii don't do daylight savings time so you never exactly know but 30 minutes is just like that's not cool no and i've i've heard parts of india do that as well i i wouldn't know first i wouldn't know for certain because i haven't had anybody from india on the show but there it, you go. Something to something to look forward to. Oh, it's not. It's not like I'm going out looking for that kind of thing. I get. I. I um. I get what I can get. <laughs> oh. But I'd like to. I'd like to open with the humble beginnings or origin story, if you will. How did you first get into role playing games, and what 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 made it stick? And I'm specifically just referring to as a as a player slash GM. Yeah. Oh, wow. So I was, uh, I was probably 10 and I had just discovered the fantasy genre mm -hmm. and I was reading, you know, the dragon riders of Pern and things like that. And my mother doing her best to kind of, she was just always very supportive of all the kind of weird and whatever wacky things that I do. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she got me this like old, I don't even think it was AD and D Dungeons and Dragons starter kit. It still sits on my shelf today. I still use those dice, and um, that was kind of my first foray into it. And she had no idea what she was doing, and I had no idea what she was doing. And it was, but it was great. And it was. Uh, it probably took a couple of years before I started. You know, I found a, a gaming group of, of friends in school. But uh, yeah, I've been on and off gaming in one form or another since then. And we're not going to talk about how many years that's been, but it's been a few. <laughs> I can, um, I never ask how I never ask how many years it's how many years it's been because I know that um whatever amount it is probably isn't the truth. <laughs> it's been seven years. I'm like I'm still a kid. No. <laughs> um, it's for it's for the same reason I always say that I be, that I became a I became a seasoned DM next month. Just keep yeah. just keep rolling the date forward because you never become a, you're never a seasoned DM or pl or player. It's like my my grandmother had a philosophy like that, which was old was always ten years older than whatever you are right now. So yeah, same kind of thing. It's a rolling number. Um, uh, and as far as the whole having no idea what you're what you're doing in those early days, I'm reminded of the words of graphic designer Paula Schur. The greatest innovations in the history of mankind were done by people who had no idea what they were doing. Probably very true. And, uh, you know, it makes me feel better about myself, too. <laughs> well, 
you look you look throughout history and you'll find plenty of inventions that happened by pure accident. I have to assume that's true for a lot of things. Like, how did anyone figure out, you know, chocolate or coffee or, you know, any of these things? Like, there's a lot of processing that happens in there. Um, I remember th I remember a while back the History Channel was doing was doing stories on the or on the origin of cer of certain candies and and toys. Um, when it came when it came to when it came to the stuff that um, Hershey wasn't was inventing, a lot of it was I have an idea. I have no idea how I'm going to how I'm going to see this idea into fruition, but it, but the idea is there. I just need to keep banging my head against the wall until I find it. Yeah, that's that sounds about right. That's I mean, it's how I do most of my day job too. If that's any help, so. <laughs> but would it be fair of me to say that you're that you weren't exactly a one system lifer over the years? You had dipped into a bunch of systems. I did indeed, um, particularly once I, I got into grad school and uh, kind of had a gaming group. We did a lot of a lot of indie gaming, so a lot of indie systems. A lot of my friends at that point are were and still are game designers, so we were always kind of play testing their stuff. Um, my husband now he had like we basically just have a system that he's cobbled together out of lots of different ideas that that is the kind of standard system that we play. So yeah. I, uh, I, I like bouncing around. I like exploring different kind of approaches to how to think about gaming and, and different ideas and different settings and all that kind of stuff. Is is that the kind of thing that played a factor in the in the fact that the Elven Renaissance project that you're developing is system agnostic? Absolutely. Yeah. It was you know this kind of idea that you could have a you could have a world and you could have a place and it didn't have to be tied to any given system, right? Sometimes sometimes like it's a little complicated if you have worlds with specific types of magic and you want to kind of have a magic system. But, you know, just having a thing that you could sort of say, you know, I think this place is cool and I like D&D &D and so that's what I want to do. Or I like, you know, Call of Cthulhu in the way that that works as a system and I want to play it from that perspective or whatever little indie thing you have. Or you don't, I don't even like things. I just like telling stories and, and not even rolling dice sometimes. Um, just you know, having that kind of flexibility I think is very important. Or in some cases, who says I have to use dice? What if I'm breaking out, and this might be a bit of a deep cut, um, Dragonlance 5th Age that used cards? Right, yeah, or any of that, right? Like, uh, it's, it's all sorts of fun alternatives, or flipping coins, or whatever you want to do. There actually, what there actually is a game in my library that that has flip that has essentially flipping coins as the uh, mechanic called Never Tell Me the Odds. I like it. I have not heard of that one. I'll have to go check it out. It's it is the definition of a micro RPG. Um, I sometimes use it for beer and pretzels things when I don't have anything else planned but i have but i have my brothers coming in um and ev and even beyond that there's there's pl there's plenty of there's plenty of weirder stuff and um well, some some people some people some people have said that using symbol based die is a bit on the fringe yet they yet they end up running something like fate which uses those um plus and minus fudge dice right or what is it like? There was one. It's I think it's called Starcross, where you actually use a, a Jenga game as your <laughs> one of your mechanics. So. On one hand, on one hand, I appreciate their ingenuity. On the other hand, I personally believe that Jenga is a violation of the Geneva Accords regarding torturing <laughs> non-combatants. <laughs> you know, that's maybe what makes it. It's all about lovers who couldn't get together. So maybe that's appropriate. Love and war and all that. I know I. I usually, my colleague has has a saying about all's fair in love and riffing, but at the, at the same at the same time, as somebody who as somebody who's messed around with board games quite a bit, you've you've probably had those mo those moments with Jenga where you're looking at everybody and going, nobody breathe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, more than once, yeah. <laughs> Especially since, if if have you ever heard the expression, there are no atheists in foxholes. Yes. I think the same thing applies to gamers. <laughs> there are no atheists at the gaming table because everybody has their own little superstitions. The more common of of it being don't roll another person's dice. Um, yeah, or you know, or a dice that's just rolled a bunch of bad ones. It's actually interesting because there's there's like a whole thing and sort of 
like a whole study of like the more uncertain your situation is, the more likely you are to turn to faith and superstition. Um, hence, foxholes and, and gaming, right? Like, <laughs> and the stakes are high and the odds are low. Yeah, I use I the prayer that we usually have here in the temple is the dice gods show no mercy because. I I find I find that the dice are a are a wonderful model for equality. It does not matter your occupation, race, gender, what have you. The dice gods hate you. <laughs> it is true. Hmm. Uh, yeah. They they That's... hate you, but they hate everyone equally. So I started making my own. So if they're really bad, I can just like shave down one side or just not put a one on them, and I'm alright. Uh. I remember one. Per I remember one person replaced the natural one with it with a middle finger. I've seen some fun, clever ones like that uh, in, in various uh, variations on that particular theme. Mm -hmm. It's pretty yeah. nice. But the now, I'd like to get into the concept of a of an elven renaissance, as you as you put it. Um, mm -hmm. Obvious, obviously, when I think of Renaissance, I immediately think of say the re the Renaissance period in Europe or the Enlightenment. And is the, where you where you had a bunch of new ideas and a bunch of a bunch of new ideas being explored because the control of information that was ha that was handled by the clergy had start had started to relax. And obviously, that's a vast simplification. But is that is that kind of the um, was that kind of is that kind of the direction that you're going with this with that concept? Part of partly. Uh, the idea is that, you know, that, that there's been this culture that's been very static for a long time because, you know, you live forever, potentially, barring disease or, or violence, and there's not much of that mm -hmm. uh, because it's sort of life is sacred because it's such a terrifying thing. If you can live forever, death is a very strange concept and one that you sort of fear and approach in a different way. But so it kind of creates a society that's, that's static and kind of values, you know, sort of things that are unchanging and it values the timeless. And so... You know, there's not a, there's not a lot of effort put on innovation. There's not a lot of effort you know, or sort of importance put on movement. Um, so the interesting, like you know, there's a um, there's a quote in Afghanistan I heard once um, that you know that that through through movement you gain knowledge and wisdom. Mm -hmm. The elves in their traditional state didn't have that. Like it was the opposite of that. Like no no no. Like if you move too much, if you wander too much, you really are lost. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's this kind of shakeup of uh, kind of what we have is a, a you know a there are planes that are constantly shifting between different realms and, and, you know, sort of they overlap for a moment here and there, but what if one got stuck? Mm -hmm. um, sort of a, a permanent gate essentially to the human realm and a couple of elves decide to go off and go see what that's all about. And there they encounter death and they begin to die and they begin to age. And, you know, there's a certain fear of that. But there's also kind of an appreciation for these kind of more human approaches to life, which are, you know, sort of evaluation of, the momentary kind of sensibilities of things, right? That that you value things because that they only last a moment. Then eventually that kind of makes its way back into the elven realm. And it starts with art, right? That kind of like the Renaissance where, you know, there were, the, you know, there was these sort of timeless, very kind of almost probably Monet pa paintings was sort of the style for a long time. There wasn't a lot of realism. There wasn't a lot of trying to capture a moment. But now these kind of new ideas, and suddenly that's that's the new trend, is trying to capture those moments. Mm -hmm. And then there's kind of these ideas about innovation, right? Like, okay, let's invent stuff. Maybe that's kind of a cool thing. And so you sort of begin to see this push in sort of science, sort of driven by this kind of hyperactivity that comes from the human realm, that they're constantly trying to delay things and figure things out. Mm -hmm. So that kind of, that sort of meets this kind of kind of clashes with these old traditions of sort of stasis and stability and sort of, sort of the Renaissance is kind of what happens when you've got a culture that's beginning to pick up some of the pieces of that and you're beginning to see these new changes in art and architecture and science. Um, but you're also seeing right violence and sort of some of these other the dark sides that come along with it. Uh, and then you kind of the, the push back against that and, and where these cultures collide and, and what that means and what that looks like and then how that creates space for spaces for cool stories, right? Because like a, a timeless, eternal, perfect world is a boring place to tell stories. Mm -hmm. um, but one that is in flux and changes, that, that's kind of a cool place. There are neat, neat stories you can tell there. Yeah. And um, I think when, when a lot of... 
when a lot of people think of of that of that Renaissance, one of the other things that that comes to, that comes to mind is the is the rapid advances and changes of technology compared to um, previous eras. And is that is that something that had been that had been considered of of a de of the elves essentially trying to using what using what they learned to um, develop develop new forms of technology. Yep, you see it. It's kind of still in its early stages. So you see certain kind of uh, we call them estates, but it's kind of classes of people that are are beginning to embrace some of that. So right, there were you know for a long time there they had had accessibility options you know they're sort of an equivalent of a wheelchair but basically a walking tree chair for individuals and no one ever really thought to say like well can you take that and somehow make that applicable to international trade by making a carriage or a wagon or something like that right? this idea that no one had ever thought to even do that and so this like how do you scale these things up and how do you but it's, it's still kind of in the early stages of trying to explore what that what that looks like if you think bigger about the ideas and what you could do, especially for a world that's infused with magic, right? And you can enchant all sorts of stuff in different ways. Okay, well, why why didn't we ever do this before? And what does that look like? Yeah, I um a particular a particular curiosity I've I've always had is in a lot in a lot of in a lot of games in in my early days you had this idea of magic and technology being mutually exclusive, but growing up with certain video games as I did. The idea of the the idea of them being two, being two parts of the same whole, and how and how that's explored has always been interesting to me. It's a it's an interesting thing because it's like why if if, if magic is everywhere, right? if magic is rare, it's maybe a different thing. But if magic is everywhere, like why wouldn't that be an infused part of how you do things better, right? Why isn't that how you power things or how you you kind of think about things and like it can absolutely be you know one part of an integrated system and it's only in our minds because we we don't necessarily live with magic in the day-to-day -day for most of us um that we kind of think of them as separate but for a world that just like where that is normal mm -hmm. totally it'd be all part of the same thing and i know some people say that that's a bit of a that's a bit of a fringe concept but i don't see that as any different than the various types of speculative sf that explores some new discovery and what that what that means for how technology develops. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that it, you know, it's, it's all kind of that like different cultures and different background. Like they would totally go at this in interesting ways, and that's yeah. Yeah. Go world building. And speak speaking of that world, when it would it be fair would it be fair to say that the, that with the whole with the whole notion of planes and the like that with those get with those gates that that are um permanent or 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 just stuck or rather that you that you ha that in some of those places you have ex you have a healthy amount of exchange between elves and humans yep um, so there's probably, you know, always been some, right? There are kind of scholars who specialized in understanding when the planes were going to align. And there's a whole cast of folks called, who are traders. And they're sort of the oddballs anyway, because they move a lot and they were always talking to strange people. And then that was sort of their, their dig. And like, so they were, they were the odd ones out, but they were always doing that. And so, um, they kind of were always were the closest thing to explorers, and so it's you know I know they take advantage as soon as anything opens up. They're they're right there, right? They they're mercantile. They're kind of thinking in this way, um, so they're they there's all they've always been quick to take advantage of that, and and that that kind of exchange and that back and forth is every time they could they were doing it. Now that there's a permanent gate. Oh yeah, like there's regular trade going back and forth through that door now. Yeah, and. The other, th the other thing, t the other thing that is in the back of my mind with the world that you described, is looking at is looking at it from the other side of the fence, because up until this point we've talked we've talked about elves going into the human world and w and the perspectives that they end up getting, but it w within the within the project has th has there been thought given to the other end of that particular spectrum, um, humans going into the wor into the world of elves. It's actually fun. So one of the, the biggest drivers is is actually half humans. 
um, or partial humans. So kind of the elves went, you know, through the human world and, you know, of, of course, romance happened. That's a thing. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, and it was quite, you know, thousands of years, really, that, that, that they were there and that some of them have gone back. And so some of them are, are, have gone back and are, are not fully elves returning. Some are partial elves. And there's like a whole term, the aqua, for folks who are of some kind of partial status, which gets into interesting things because they have different bits and pieces of a, a soul they don't necessarily have a complete soul in local eyes and so it's a lot of a lot of the book actually sort of or the, the setting rests on perspectives that other various cultures within the elves have towards those folks and with that too you're going to see some humans who have come in as well and i think that that's a there's a whole kind of town in a small region around the gate in particular that is much more friendly to kind of People, humans, dwarves, whatever kind of classical you know, or other planes you might want to connect in there and other kind of, well, different heritages. Um, and they're more friendly to them, but the further you get from that place, the the more your ears are rounded or you look a little funny, the, the, less, the less friendly everyone gets towards you for the most part. Mm-hmm. And with it. Since you mentioned the you mentioned the the concept of soul as well as the uh, as well as the whole eight elements thing, which ties into the dice as part of this Kickstarter, um, I'm cur- I'm curious I'm curious what the what those elements what those elements would be and how that how how that would tie into the culture and and magic and the like. Yeah, it, that was kind of a fun. You know, sometimes like you you do collective brainstorming with folks, and you don't even you don't even know where ideas come from, but they just sort of appear, and you decide you really like them. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so the the basic idea that there are you know every elven full elven soul is comprised of eight pieces, and each piece is kind of color coded, and and when you you are born, they come together into your your soul for your life, and when you die, they all kind of scatter and go back every which way. So there's a reincarnation, but it's not necessarily a one to one. You don't always get the same soul. You get whatever conglomeration of soul bits that have come before or after. Um, but yes, each one's kind of tied to really sort of a deep elven value, um, and and each of those then align to particular occupations for lack of a better word so you know there's one sort of piece of a soul the white piece of the soul that's very much tied to scholasticism so if you have a very dominant sort of scholastic soul if that piece of your eight is sort of really your dominant piece um they'll they'll kind of there are scholars and and spiritualists who will identify that early on and they will say okay you know you're you're destined really to be a scholar this is what you're going to be good at um and this you know there's it kind of runs in family lines sometimes but not always and so that that then there's like a whole thing. So then there's there are certain like that color will be the color that you sort of most find yourself associating with. And there are certain foods then that you are more likely to eat because they're also associated with the color white and scholasticism. And that's kind of where your your dominant traits are gonna be. And there are certain holidays that sort of celebrate scholars and you're gonna, you know, those are gonna be the ones where you really shine and that kind of thing. So each each color, each piece of the soul kind of ties into um, loosely, at least, into kind of what your your occupation is going to be, what you're going to do, what you're drawn to. Um, and, of course, you can wind up with people who are quite balanced that way, which is part of it, right? Because that's that's how people fall out. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's interesting because there are, there are nine major occupation categories and only eight pieces of the soul. And that's sort of an interesting question of, of how uh, how that particular mismatch happened. And I'm not certain I know the answer yet, but that's that's something to keep exploring. I could see one, and I could see one of them being the being the wild card in the same way that, in BattleTech, the Clanners' um, ca- cast system has one, has one uh, has one cast that pe- that people don't want to admit exists. That being the Bandit cast. Oh. But I get, yeah. I get yeah. the feeling that the, the way you have the way you have elves in this setting work. They're not. They're not exact. They're not. Ex- they're cat. They would. It would be cast leaning, but not necessarily a hard cast system. Yeah, very much so. It's so. It's more about kind of an occupation that you sort of fit into, and it's in theory they're all equally balanced. In reality, 
looks like rangers who are kind of out there in the woods and and defenders who would be kind of you know fighter types or maybe they're kind of not held as in high esteem as artisans and artists and and um then there are people who do a lot of like the food production right which is sort of a we think about it as being a laborer kind of job but they're actually sort of held in some of the highest esteem because they're seen to be as some of the they they can talk equally to people and the land and plants and so a lot of times they're they're sort of seen as very good politicians actually because they're very good at talking to very different kinds of people and souls and spirits and things like that mm-hmm. so so yeah officially there are no hardline caste divides but in reality there's definitely uh this is definitely a, a thing that people identify around and they, there are us versus them elements to it when it comes to magic, um, even even the even the softest of magic systems in fa- in fantasy has to have some sort of structure built um, built around it. And what I'm curious ab- what I'm curious about is how within this kind of setting, when you have magic being a natural such a natural thing, how you have it work. Yeah, so it's one of those things that this is this will be one of the places where there's a lot of kind of notes for the for a GM to say, hey, look, this is the the theory and the premise behind it, and then you can kind of look at your whatever system you might be using and decide what that means for you. So, outside of the mage occupation kind of cast, which there is one, and they specialize in in magic use, you know, perhaps you have. Everyone has access to if you're using a D and D kind of game, like a, a cantrip or two, or you know if you're using another system of magic. You, know, you just there's like some low level magic that you can kind of do, and then there are other you know certain things that you can do that that everyone can do at certain times of the year or whatever. And here are some ideas for that. And then for people who actually you know focus on magic use, um, you know it'll be okay. there's kind of some concepts of ley lines and things like that, and and um, Playing with ideas of, you know, things like Whis from different kinds of magic systems where there are, you know, sources of magic where you might find kind of intense pieces of it. Um, But a lot of that can be tailored. So it's kind of providing enough detail that people can kind of say, oh, yeah, I can plug this into sort of an elemental system if I want or or whatever it might be for people who are magic users. Um, Or, you know, I can tailor it and say, hey, you know, I'm going to interpret that as being... You know, this lines up with the kind of D and D magic schools or or whatever it may be. So it's it's this kind of fine line of being like this whole place is infused with magic and giving it that sensibility, while sort of giving people the freedom to decide like how they're going to interpret that into a, a system. Mm-hmm. And to that to that end, much like with technology and science fiction, um, magic u- magic use is a series of questions. Obvious, obviously, the harder, the harder, soft question is the obvious one. But just in just in terms of, is it something that people instinctively do? Do they have to use words? Do they have to? Is it is it something that can that can be messed around with, or is it fire and forget? Those those I th- those I think are questions that a G- that a GM is going to be considering regarding what si- whether or not that setting will be a fit for a give for a given system. Yeah, that's a that's a fair question, um, and not one I necessarily thought about in that perspective. Um, I think well, throughout the the kind of setting, what we do is we include little like call out boxes that are like, "Hey, these are points where you know here's if you run this on your own, here's how you can run it. But if you want to change it, this is how you can do it." So religions sort of falls into that category too, um, and I think that this might be one of those things where we we might provide a hey look. If we were just doing this and we didn't have a system and we were just playing pretend and occasionally rolling dice because we, but with no real system behind it, this is how we would do it, mm-hmm. um, which would be you know probably something that's a little more intuitive, right? It's it's you know people who use magic like we you know use our limbs, right? It's not a, a for most people it's not something that they put a lot of thought into, and, and people who are mages and they study it, they may have kind of different sort of patterns and mnemonics and ways of memorizing things, and that. It might include speech patterns or, or moving their hands, but that's much more about a convenient shortcut than it is about being essential to the magic, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But hey, if you want to like run a system that's D&D and you want to have spell components and things like that, sure, like you can just make that tweak and say that that's the case, and, and there you go. Yeah. Um, if a, you're right, that's worth calling out and thinking about. So. Yeah, for me personally, most of the time when I run something D20 related, if I'm 
Um, like if like if I'm running D and I don't use the default casting setup. I use the setup that was in Spheres of Power. If you're familiar with that book, I am not familiar with that one though. Spheres of Power was a is a third party um, alternate casting system that originally was built for Pathfinder. Then they converted it to Fifth Edition's rule set. It is le it is less it is less defined spell book based and more talent based. It's the best way to describe it is a combination of talents and talent trees and traditions. The tradition is essentially the rules of spell casting, and because of that, the the um, primary the primary ability score for spell casting is not set. When you when the system is utilized, um, traditions traditions kind of have a advantage disadvantage set set up in order to reinforce certain rules. Like if you're if you're if you're if you're to put in a if you're to put in a setup where you have to you have to write you have to write out a a rune on a wall in order to do that in order to do a certain effect that would qualify or if your setting um only can only utilize certain elements or certain styles of spell casting that would apply under traditions the talents are essentially talent trees um a ta talents would a um each of those each of them start with a sphere things like destruction fire water etc et um which grant a basic spell and additional talents can be developed into to allow you to do more things with that basic spell. That's kind that's kind of the approach that it takes. The reason Yeah, I, I like that actually. No, that's good. That's a vast simplification. There's a couple there's a couple of videos that the developer of it has done to kind of show what you can do with that system. And he's fr he's mentioned that could you this is some could you use it to do the exact same kind of magic system you'd see in D and D? Yes, but you could. But that's not. But um, just going with that is is selling things a bit short because if you wanted to do the say the metal ingestion that you see in the Mistborn books, good books by the way, um, you that's one option. If you wanted to do it, that it's a na that it's a natural thing that tires you out instead of you, instead of utilizing a set amount of charges that's just as, that's just as doable or if you want to have it that it's that spells are blood sacrifices and inv and invocations to a deity that's also doable uh, interesting i'm gonna have to look that up i think that might be a useful kind of hey you know if you don't have a system here's like a here's a nice sort of way that might work yeah they eventually did a martial sister book to it called spheres of might and and as an interesting aside, you mentioned you mentioned the myth things like warriors and rangers being held, not being held in the highest of regards, and I'm I'm guessing that the reasoning for that is it's kind of hard for them to be in to be held in high regard when there's not a whole lot of fighting going on for the longest time. Yeah, exactly. It's not it's not a martial culture. There's you know that's um, there's no idea there's no sense of warrior kings or anything like that, and. Uh, it's you know they they sort of pride themselves on themselves as a whole as being very kind of deft politically and that that's you know a someone who's a, a really really good speaker is going to be more impressive to them than someone who's a really good fighter. Mm -hmm. um, that said, they have some they have some fun dueling cultures that they've picked up as a as a way to like solve problems sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. But it's in sort of certain areas where they're known for being a bit more hot headed. Some good, some good old pistols at noon, just without the pistols. <laughs> you know, you just like you, you need a little bit of dueling culture. It's good. It's good stuff. It's very, it's all very polite though. And I'm, I'm guess, I'm guess, even with that, I'm get, I'm guessing that in the in this particular setting, once you're out in the wilderness, there's plenty of there's plenty of th um, threats that would that would love to have you for lunch. 
Oh yeah, that's there. It is a it is a wild world. It is full of magic, and these like little portals to other realms still do pop open on occasion with no warning, and that's why the rangers are there. Actually, that's kind of their their role is to sort of patrol the wildernesses. And so when something from the plane of fire shows up unexpectedly, like there's someone out there to spot it and deal with it. Um, so there there are lots of little things out there that. Uh, uh, could uh, could quite can end people quite early and quite violently. So we have so we have the welcome to Australia rule. <laughs> Pretty well, much. <laughs> welcome to the land down under, where everything in the wildlife wants to kill you. Yeah, I mean not everything, but they, if not, they don't want to kill you. Then they may just want to like steal whatever trinkets you have in your pockets. But one or the other. Damn gnomes. <laughs> Pixies, you know these things. <laughs> Well, pixies are just jerks. <laughs> oh. And I know we there was there was mention of of other fantasy races like dwarves, which, um, given given how in a lot of set in a lot of settings, dwar the only thing that elves and dwarves agree upon is that one of them is wrong. <laughs> um, I'm curious if I'm curious if that's something that can come into play when you have that um, cultural intermixing. I think I think there's probably not as a yet. There's not a lot of of interaction there, so there's not necessarily like a known antipathies, right? Like they they sort of might see them more as interesting and odd and still very foreign, but they wouldn't be any weirder than seeing humans. In fact, probably they'd, they'd be more almost exotic. Like what what on earth is this? Um, but I, I suspect there are you know. We had talked early on about, you know, the occasionally when when planar doors do open to the dwarven homes. That uh, you know, th there's different kinds of trade and sort of what you know what comes back there, right? Like the occasional dwarven whiskey or something like that that comes back that is highly prized because it's not made in the elven world, um, that kind of thing. But I think that they're they're still a little exotic because that 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 door hasn't solidified yet. Mm -hmm. um, um, but that's you know that's the next Kickstarter, yeah. I think. Um, there's a run there's a running gag that I have that we have in the temple. Um, regarding a, regarding a question that's often brought up with dwarves, and that is, if dwarves live underground so much, why do they always use axes? The answer is quite simple: elves live in trees. It's reasonable. <laughs> oh, but he, but even I want, with I want dwarves that live in the trees, though, too, right? Like that. Like I want a, I want a complex dwarf home. Mm -hmm. Oh. I'm just I'm just I'm just poking fun at some at some of the more common motifs with that with that kind of thing. Yep. Because again, all's fair in love and riffing. <laughs> but what I do know what I do notice when I looked at the when I looked at the world map on the Kickstarter, well as as best as as best as I could because um, I can only do I can only do so much with with an image of that size. <laughs> but. Yeah. I hit. I was able to see enough to see that there's definitely different biomes, and I'm guessing within that there are different there are different subcultures of elves, which, from my perspective, is a good way to get away from the st the tree ba the tree centric stereotype that a lot of people have with elves. Yeah, that was very much what we wanted to do. You know it, that it's that <laughs> there's a whole world of elves, and so there are elves that sure do live in trees. Um, they're kind of the jerkiest elves, to be honest. Um, but there are elves that live in island archipelagos, right? So you've got your islander elves of different kinds. You've got sort of your desert elves. You have mountain-based elves that do a lot of actual mining and things like that. Uh, they do it slightly differently, perhaps. They they sort of... A lot of magic users that, that center around earth-based magics that sort of grow minerals out of the ground um, rather than sort of cutting into the ground so much. But still, right, like... They're, like they're a little more salt of the earth, a little more mining based elves. You've got your like what would almost be hobbit elves that like do a lot of growing of things and sort of, you know, the breadbasket elves. So mm -hmm. yeah, we wanted to play around with like that there are different cultures, subcultures within that space. Yeah, and when it comes for whatever reason, when it comes to the mountain elves, and maybe I'm wrong on this, I see them as being significantly taller than some of the others. I haven't thought about that. Mostly, like the the kind of what you see in human populations for for the most part, except for the, some of the Scandinavian ones who like to defy everything. But a lot of um, populations, <laughs> the closer closer you get to hotter climates, the taller people get. 
Um, and then sort of closer you get to northern, colder climates rather, like the shorter people get. Um, and and high, at high altitudes, sometimes that can be different. But, I mean, what makes you think that the mountain elves will be taller? Call it a, call it a hunch. Reasonable I, reason for anything. <laughs> yeah. Um. I think I think the I think the reason why I say that is uh, is um is lo is longer reach when it comes when it comes to moving across such uneven terrain. Yeah, kind of like just long limbed sort of mountain goatee type things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that because it? I think I think about I think about some um, the 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 way taller people climb versus the way shorter people climb because I've done I've done my fair share of rock climbing though I'm not dumb enough to try do f to try do free soloing <laughs> even pros don't do that <laughs> and some people say, some people swear up and down that you that you can do it if you if you're if you're um well, if you're practiced enough but no <laughs> I I never rec I never recommend anyone doing that because things can happen And I'd ra I'd rather have a harness on when things happen than not have one. Yeah, it's probably true. Like it's like a life philosophy, really. <laughs> I worked in ins I worked in insurance at one point, and every and plenty of people think plenty of people think, oh, I'm fine. I'm an I'm an excellent driver. Nothing's gonna happen to me. And everybody and everybody else is like, it's not you that we're worried about. You can be the best yeah. driver in the. You can be the best driver in the world. That's not going to save you from one person who is not who is an idiot driver. Yeah, I rode a motorcycle for a while, and uh, oh yeah, it's it is literally everyone else on the road that scares me. <laughs> oh, I usually just get scared whenever whenever I see a little bit of bad weather because I know somebody's going to do something stupid. Yep. But. Even with even within that, I'm gu I'm guessing that within the within um a lot within a lot of stories involving elves, especially when they're when they're far more long lived, there is a no there is the notion of old grudges or or old stories still ha still having still having weight as well as certain rivalries or disagreements, and I'm. Guessing that that still holds true with this setting. Oh, absolutely. Uh, nobody holds a, a petty grudge like an elf. Um, they they hold. In fact, they. It's great because I've actually built some of this in. But they will take centuries to play out an insult. Sometimes, right? Like that. And it like I sort of uh, was playing with one idea where if you've got someone who makes pottery and they they feel they've been slighted, maybe over the next. 20 years every piece of, of pottery that they make for different people if you put them all together they might make a mosaic that you know shed bat like would you know, just showed like an embarrassing scene of whoever their enemy was but like you wouldn't know that unless you figured out like found all of those pieces and put them together and like over a span of a ridiculously long time um yeah and well i ha i have a i've I've had a fondness for one particular avenue that the dwarves in War in um, Warhammer Fantasy have, and that is the Book of Grudges. <laughs> Ooh, that is good. Which is a, every dw every dwarf clan has one. It is this massive tome that contains every single slight that in, that a dwarf has had, and the book never runs out of pages. <laughs> And every, every suspect, single... Go ahead. Suspect they have something similar. I suspect they uh they'd be like, they would say like no, you don't write it down. That's just you just have to remember all of it. <laughs> yeah, but every single one of them has to be of uh, has to be righted in some in some manner. Some people have multiple multiple pages worth of grudges dedicated to them because they are actually... spite they are spiteful little fuckers. I know. I mean, that's uh, people are right. Like every kind of people is. Um, so th there's actually a holiday that we created for the Elven Renaissance world. Um, 
that is it's supposed to be like the airing of grievances and then you burn it away like that's, it's supposed to be like how you do reconciliation and it's like nice but everyone kind of pays lip service to it a little bit and just uses it as an excuse to like get a little drunk and like yell at the people they're real mad at and they don't ever like actually forgive and forget but the idea is there which is is understandable and i'm since you have a bunch of drinking and yelling, it's inevitable that that starts into the punching and kicking. I don't think it does much. I think maybe a little bit once in a while. Um, it's mostly just who can who can yell more cleverly. Oh, the oh the whole the whole um, art of the creative insult. Exactly, which is particularly fun if you've had a couple of drinks. Mm -hmm. Oh, and that. In that regard, I can understand why the, why somebody who's able to bring in um, bring in dwar bring in dwarven beer would be would be highly valued. Exactly right. Like if you can knock people unexpectedly sideways. Because no nobody's staying sober after that. <laughs> exactly. Best case scenario, you just get knocked out. <laughs> oh. But but even even within the, even within that, I'd imagine that, um, with that that some of the some of the different subcultures of elves have um have different attitudes regarded regarding the whole human thing, and I'd Im I'd imagine that much like how you much like how you have certain um cringy f cringy fans of things or po or posers in the real world you the possibility of some elves trying to emulate their idea of humans is in the cards yeah, i think it, there are sort of different ways that they've they've adopted this i mean most people would you know it's kind of like what's fashionable in the moment right like maybe that's that's cool right now and you know that's the, all the rage and the equivalent of paris and so mm. there'll be somebody to like weird interpretations you know kind of Humanity seen through a lens darkly, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, oh, uh, what are you shooting for as far as a page count for this particular project? So my guess is it'll be about a hundred pages if I had to make a guess, which you know is not nearly enough to describe an entire world, but is also uh, any longer than that. You start to lose people, I think. Well, I th I think th I think that with the way you've described it. Would it be fair of me to to assume that you want to give just enough in, just enough info about the setting so that people can so that people could run campaigns in it, but not too much to the point where you deal with the meta narrative problem that games like Shadowrun have had? Yeah, yeah, I was trying to find out like that that fine line. Mm -hmm. And granted, granted, finding that fine line is not is not is certainly not an easy task, but. It is it is one worth pursuing, and I'm it's kind of a weird figure. And given given that I know, I know you had mentioned putting in putting in some major and mi and minor NPCs. Um, have you given thought to putting story seeds into the book? Yeah, so I, I kind of try to lace them through a little bit, just kind of like little ideas of like, hey, here's here's something that could be an interesting like plot hook or story starter or things like that um my my intent is to have you know well, we've broken the stretch goal to to have like one campaign that could be a campaign you know as a like a one shot but it could also be the, like a much broader like hey starter for how these things go so yeah i definitely want to kind of include just places for people to figure out like where they could riff off of and how they could use that to tell stories mm -hmm. and I I do want to I do want to give my congrats for how, for how well the Kickstarter has gone with even with so much time even with so much time to go because at the time of this recording you're at 3200 and you're only asking for 2k um what are you shoot what are you shooting for as far as the release window for it not a date, yeah, so but a window no yeah no we're hoping to have it by by this this coming winter uh, the end of the year would be really nice um we have i think probably it's about 80 percent of the first draft of the writing is done so a lot of the rest is just kind of artwork it's getting the the dice add-ons it's making sure that we have a good editor come in and actually do that it's play testing a couple of things to you know make sure uh, it's getting beta readers which are you know all the, the kickstarter backers get to be a beta reader if they want to um 
kind of, you know, hey, this is like, it would be helpful to have more plot hooks or, hey, I need to know more about this if I want to run a game or, or whatever. So, um, and hope and hopefully put in an index. You know, I haven't thought about an index. I guess that's what the editor is for. <laughs> My sister, she, she's going to strangle me. <laughs> um, I, um, I've had, I've had a bit of, I, one of my whipping boys has been has been Palladium games, um, in particular the Rifts games, which I I love their setting. I hate I hated their system, and the problem I had with their books was not ha was one not having an index and two having a very inaccurate table of contents. Mm. So ev any any time any time a game any time a book doesn't have it doesn't have an index if it's over a certain page threshold. That's and that's an automatic demerit. As some, imagine imagine having a three hundred page core book with no index. Yeah, no. <laughs> that drives me nuts. That drives me nuts. Yeah, that that, um, that was that was a common thing with Palladium stuff. So it'd be so when I so when I'd need to look up a specific rule instead of looking at it through the book i would end up having a, my own books of ju of just cheat sheets and similar notes which is not i think not the way i think that kind of thing should be done yeah i agree i hadn't really thought about an index but i think you're right i think that that for something this long it well, it didn't start this long it just kind of has become this long um i think you're right that that is a good thing to include yeah oh, thanks um i've I've dipped into web, into web usability in the past, and um, proper navigation was something that got beaten into my head. Because, yeah. Especially, especially since if you don't want if you don't want to frustrate people going to a website, um, you need to, you need to make it explicitly clear where they are and where they need to go. It's true. Yeah, a little bit of user testing in a, in a sense might not be a terrible thing either. Yeah. And I'd with that with that kind of with that kind of thing in mind, if you were if you were to do some some sort of some sort of campaign section in that regard or some sort of uh, one shot kind of thing, would you end up writing it out like a like a act like a broad act structure? Like these are the major bullet point things to happen in Act One, Two, and Three, kind of way. Probably. Um, I've got some couple. Uh, so the system Coriolis is is really good for. Um, they, they've done some really nice things with some of their one shots and how they they organize them. So I think that would like pulling from their ideas of how to think about that would probably be some of my first inspiration. Yeah, Cor Coriolis is pretty good, and that's. I have I haven't come across a bad take with the year zero system, oh period. Um, the wor the worst the worst that I could say is 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 a couple is a couple of them having having a bit of lacking examples, but that's nit that's nitpicky at best, and I'm looking forward to seeing how the Blade Runner game is gonna tur is gonna turn out, which surprised it took this long for us to get a Blade Runner RPG period. Uh, true. Oh, but with all with all of that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. My pleasure. It was uh, you know, this wasn't it wasn't terribly madness. It was it was a good amount of madness, so we're good. Yeah, I um, I. I think a lot. I think a lot of people have the assumption that I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do interviews in the in a very scripted manner, and I don't script it, because <laughs> that whole open bar of the internet isn't just isn't just a catchphrase. That's how I treat interviews. It's not. It, I'm not some highfalutin inside the actor's studio kind kind of approach. It's just two. Pe it's just two people who know too much about um games, sharing drinks. That's that's kind of how I take it. How I approach it. It's, it was nice, actually. It, you know, not it was a conversation, right? Less than yep. a, more than an interview, which is nice. Oh, but anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to dis whether it's to discuss um, the Elven Renaissance further, or to debate whether or not Monopoly is the board game equivalent of a death march, <laughs> the door is always huh. open to you. Is that even a debate? It absolutely is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!